What first comes to mind when I say the word rockabilly? What about Greaser? Surely, flashbacks of vintage Americana come to mind, like the performers of an aging generation such as Elvis Presley, Joey D and the Starlighters, and Carl Perkins. But also old Chevrolets, motorcycles, leather, and extravagant hairstyles. All of these things that originated in an era now long gone is what I thought of as well. However, I never would have imagined that the heart of rockabilly is alive and beating in the streets of modern day Japan. Today, I have the honor of presenting you their very captivating story. This is the Japanese Rockabillies. Let's take a trip back in time to post war Japan in the 1950s. From the years 1945 to 1952, following Japan's surrender, America occupied the archipelago and enacted widespread military, political, economic, and social reforms. Many military bases were placed around the country, and because of this fact, American culture had began to spill out and be shared amongst the citizens of Japan. Due to the fact that the American soldiers were away from home for so long, they began to miss their culture and the music that would play on the radio in the United States. They tried their best to recreate an almost home-like atmosphere in their stations by fully equipping their bases with the infrastructure necessary to play and enjoy the music they were accustomed to. The first sounds to be integrated into Japan were those of jazz and classical Western music. Aspiring musicians of this era were for the first time exposed to this music, which at the time was unknown and completely foreign to them. Many who grew up during this time were one, influenced by these new sounds that they had never heard before, and two, were performers who relied on the approval of American soldiers who made up most of their audience. After being exposed to this new, exciting form of music, this led to the birth of a new wave of performers who tried their best to appeal to the taste of the soldiers, even going as far as singing in English. This feat may seem routine by modern standards, but this is the early 50s. Most Japanese performers had never even heard a Southern American accent before, let alone perform an entire live show with one. Among these first performers was Ihara Takata, a big fan of Western movies and the music that was featured in them, who helped to form what is arguably the first Western group in Japan, the Chuck Wagon Boys. After some time spent with this group, he decided a rebrand was necessary. Takatada would then reform the group with Kusaka Kazuya as lead vocalist, and the name was changed to Wagon Masters after the Western film of the same name. The group performed fairly well and they played consistent shows in the military bases of Yokota, Tachikawa, and other neighboring outposts. Takatada, however, would leave the group in 1954, opting for a more secure future as an executive at Nippon Columbia. Within the following year, he made the decision to sign his old group to the label and discuss the possibility of releasing a new series of songs sung by Kosaka. With these new songs, Takatada believed that Wagon Masters could achieve success with a broader audience that wasn't just military men. Kosaka was as well determined to improve his vocal style. He would frequently be asked by servicemen to perform their favorite songs and would always agree and then ask them to write down the lyrics for him. Then, by the next week, he'd have it perfected for the stage. Kosaka himself has stated that he was always inspired by the overly confident soldiers that he was surrounded by. And in his autobiography, Made in Occupied Japan, he says that he even grew up with an inferiority complex to America that pushed him even harder to succeed. Takatada's earlier prediction was correct, however, with the wagon masters becoming fairly popular with the youth, specifically those who frequented the bustling jazz kisas, or jazz cafes, which would play the newest and hottest music out of America. In 1956, however, the band released their interpretation of Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis Presley, and the success of this release would fully open the door for the rockabilly craze that was to come within the following years. And by the end of the year, Kosaka had become one of the most popular musical performers in all of Japan. Along with a number of other key players such as Mickey Curtis, Jimmy Tokita, and Biji Kuroda, it's important to note that Rockabilly's first real success in Japan, though, would take place in 1955 with the release of the American movie Blackboard Jungle, which depicted the life and violence that takes place in urban schools. It featured the song Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley and his comments, which became an instant hit with the youths of Japan and symbolized almost a revolt against the pre-war values that many had come to know. This film would end up being banned in certain American cities because of fear that it would incite juvenile violence. And these same fears were shared with Japanese society as well. These tensions concerning the moral quality of rock and roll and those of the Rokaberizoku would only be exacerbated following a very controversial live show a few years later. 
By this point in time, the aforementioned jazz kisas, which could normally seat approximately 100 spectators, were quickly becoming too small for the rockabilly artists who would usually perform there. This led to the acquisition of the Nichigeki Theater. Many of these performances took place during the day because the primary audience of these artists were high schoolers who couldn't stay the late hours in a kisa to see their favorite groups play live. These performances in the newly acquired theater were dubbed the Western Carnival by the members of the Wagon Masters. In 1958, a cleverly crafted series of events would ensue to guarantee the success of the Western Carnival. Hori Takeo, guitarist of Wagon Masters, wanted to bring rockabilly to a much larger audience, and because of this, decided to work with Watanabe Productions for management over the event. It was Watanabe Misa who overlooked the entire production and sought advice from her sister on how to instruct the fans, who were mainly young women, to act when the performers arrived on stage. Everything was in order, and come the day of the performance, the large crowd of excited young women surrounding the theater continued to grow, and because of this, they were permitted entrance two hours in advance due to safety reasons. The scene that ensued would send Japanese society into shock. It's important to note beforehand that rockabilly at this point had veered off from the direction of taking direct inspiration from its American originators. Due to the decrease of American stations at the end of the occupation, the performers who had started their careers in military bases no longer needed to appeal and imitate when they wrote and sang, which allowed these artists to finally experiment, improvise, twist, and maneuver their music in a way that they always wanted to, creating a style of music that would captivate Japanese audiences in a way never seen before. This concert was a feat to behold, with artists like Yamashita Keijiro, the aforementioned Mickey Curtis, and Hirao Masaki playing in a trio, later called Rokabiri Sonin Otoko by the press, literally three rockabilly guys, and performing a string of covers of a classic American rock and roll that would set the energy of the crowd on fire. The crowd began to cheer and cheer and cheer so loud that eventually they overpowered the sound equipment in the theater, and because of this, Yamashita Keijiro began to move much more frantically and sporadically to make up for the fact that the audience could no longer hear him. In reaction to this, the girls in the crowd only became more excited and began throwing streamers, toilet paper, and even their undergarments at the performers on stage. Evidently, these events threw the older generation and the media into a moral panic. And this led to this new wave of rock and roll not being appreciated by everybody, mainly with police. It is unclear why the rockabilly scene was met with such violent backlash from law enforcement, but some theories try to posit a clear answer as to why. The invention of rock and roll in America is directly linked to the civil rights movement of the time and the push for societal, political, and generational change. Because of these movements attached to the genre, some critics of rock and roll at the time linked it to drug use, low morals, sexual promiscuity, crime, and even anti-government thinking. Japan in 1958 was dealing with its own swelling political tension as well, which, in turn, swayed public support for a very controversial educational bill to be passed by the newly formed Liberal Democratic Party, which would enforce stricter pre-war morals and discipline into curriculum to combat the growing influence of American individualism in Japan. This fact inspired university students of the time to radicalize and revolt against these changes. This linked with the growing popularity and rowdiness of rockabilly venues, such as the Western Carnival, caused the government to conflate the two different groups and attack them with equal force. A second theory takes a different angle. A new group of delinquent youth began to spring up around the country during the same era, causing trouble for police and endangering themselves by going on loud, fast, dangerous rides on their motorcycles. They were dubbed the Kaminarizoku, or Thunder Tribe. They were mainly young ex-kamikaze pilots who had returned from the war, disillusioned and dissatisfied with the current society in Japan, and most of all, wanted that feeling of danger and camaraderie that they were accustomed to during war times. They resembled the rockabillies who fashioned themselves in leather and were even inspired by American movies such as Rebel Without a Cause. They had a never-ending rivalry with the police force and as well, because of their appearance, were conflated with the rockers of the late 50s. Whichever the correct theory may be, one thing is true. Police crackdowns on rockabilly venues and political crises throughout the early and mid-1960s led to a growing fear of an overtly American influence in Japan. It is because of these factors that the booming rockabilly scene would quickly die out. But with the start of the 1980s, the culture once again started to shift. There was a renewed interest in musical subculture all around the world. In England, it was the death of the punks and the birth of goth. In America, it was the birth of hardcore. And in Japan, we saw the repopularization of the rockabillies. Our story continues in Harajuku, a district in Tokyo well-renowned for its deep culture, 
both in the worlds of fashion and in art. In the 80s, it was the era of the Harajuku Hokuten. Hokuten here is short for Hokushaten Goku, literally meaning pedestrian paradise. These were sections of streets closed off from traffic for pedestrians so they can enjoy socializing, eating snacks, or listening to musicians. During this period, it wouldn't be uncommon to see all the different subcultures enjoying the open space, like the colorful Takinokozoku parading the streets in their exuberant outfits for the occasional punk rock performer. But the Hokuten was also a safe space for our rowdy, big-haired rockers to reappear. It's here where Jess Yamanaka would found one of the oldest and most prevalent groups in the Hokuten, the Strangers. According to Jess, he ripped the name straight from an English dictionary after reading the definition. He felt moved by the meaning of this foreign word, a person who does not know or is not known in a particular place or community. Among the mass of people in the Hokuten, this group of rock and roll loving enthusiasts would dance for the spectators. They were among 100 or 200 other rockabilly groups who would give the onlookers an incredible show filled with kicks, splits, twists, and jibes. This pomade paradise, however, was short-lived because in 1998, the Harajuku Hokuten was suspended permanently. Since then, the group has relocated and has been dancing in Yoyogi Park ever since. And it makes sense that the group would reform in this location, because according to Jess, in this park, there used to be an American military base where he would always hear rock and roll blasting from the barracks inside. This new, loud, energetic music captivated his mind and inspired a deep love which is still going strong more than 30 years later. The law enforcement station in Yoyogi Park are also grateful for the strangers, because their placement helps ward off dangerous gangs from planting themselves in the park. Charlie himself adds, We help out with cleaning up trash and whatnot. Anything we can. And even today, it's still possible to catch the strangers do their act in Yoyogi Park. They dance just about every Sunday and are excited about the fact that they get to do so with others who love the twists and jumps of 50s America as much as they do. But there have existed in the past other well-known groups around Tokyo. Take the Tokyo Rockabilly Club, for example, once the most notorious dance group in all of Tokyo. They began around the same time as the Strangers and danced among rival teams in the Hokuten. They, like the Strangers, have no barrier of entry for joining the group. The only prerequisite applied is that you must have a love for rock and roll and a commitment to the lifestyle of a rocker. The Tokyo Rockabilly Club, however, are less prevalent than they were in previous years. This renowned era of the rockabilly subculture birth in the 80s is focused mainly on dance and community, and groups like the Strangers wish to distance themselves from the violence associated with the first waves of rockabilly. Despite all of the change and evolution that the styles and subcultures of Japan have gone through, there still exists a die-hard group of individuals who are willing to protect their subculture no matter what the cost. The strangers aren't the only ones keeping the world of biker grease and leather alive. For the rockabillies of Japan, there's a fresh-faced mascot dead set on keeping the traditions alive. He goes by the name of Johnny Daigo. Hailing from Yokohama, Johnny was first introduced to rock and roll at the age of 15 by listening to a CD by Tomayasu Hote, a famous Japanese musician with a career spanning more than 40 years. It was this discovery that changed his life and inspired him to become the energetic, pompadour-boasting musician that we know him as today. Inspired as well by the music of Elvis and Chuck Berry, Johnny has become a sort of idol figure for the new generation of rockabillies. Starting his musical career at the age of 18, he's been consistently performing for nearly 10 years and is currently on tour around Asia. Johnny, whose name comes from a 1950s-style bar named Johnny Angel, in which he previously worked, blends the classical sounds of Japanese music with the flair and energy of mid-century American rock. He's titled this sound, Samurai Rock and Roll. He as well takes inspiration from the classic rockabilly groups of Japan, like Carols and The Cools, who are key figures in the rockabilly revival during the 80s. He plays in the band Johnny Pandora, and will release four full-length LPs, their most recent being 2023's Weekender. Their performances are known for being loud, explosive, and energetic, with Johnny occasionally breaking out into his famous Japanese twist. While his guitarist runs into the crowd and performs while surrounded by the audience. With tracks like Yokohama Cruisin', Crying for the Moon, and Rock Me Baby, it's easy to see the appeal of this vintage four-piece. But, as well, he's seen a bit of international exposure thanks to his appearance in the music video for Youngblood by Five Seconds of Summer. But, despite all of this, there are fears that the subculture is a dying one. Johnny himself laments that styles shift and change too quickly in Japan, 
the Harajuku that was once teeming with crazy hairstyles and teams parading in leather was quickly replaced by the extravagance of Gyaru and the ruffles and frills of Lolita. The future seems uncertain, but these rockers hold strong to the culture and history that they were raised in and are firmly dedicated to keeping the spirit of rock and roll alive for the newer generations to appreciate. It was with nothing but admiration and fascination that I decided to plunge into the research for today's video. I'll tell you something now. It's that I first stumbled on these rockers by complete accident. This video right here showed up on my explore page and it blew my mind. I had to find out where this interest for 50s rock originated from because I had no idea that there existed such a subculture overseas. As someone who grew up in the United States and is very well familiarized with this lifestyle and form of music, it was an incredibly pleasant surprise to see this art form be represented with such love and appreciation. The dedication that these musicians and these dancers pour into their lifestyle is something that deserves the utmost respect. From the earliest performances by the Wagon Masters to present day with Johnny Pandora, it's interesting to see how the subculture evolved from the 50s with the first few introductions of the genre to now. And I'm excited to see what the future has in store for Johnny Pandora, The Strangers, and the rest of the rockers. And I wish all of these groups the best of luck in their future endeavors. Thank you guys so much for watching as always. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to leave a like and comment and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this in the future. The research for this one was intense. So as well, I'll leave you all the resources that I used in the description below. And as well, if there are any mistranslations, any mistakes, or anything that you think is missing, do not hesitate to correct me. Thanks once again, and peace. See you in the next one.